India is home to all the major religions of the world. Its spiritual traditions and ancient philosophy are becoming increasingly relevant in a modern materialistic age beset with stress and tensions. All these traditions have evolved over thousands of years and they have come to accommodate all manners of beliefs from nature worship to monotheism, polytheism, even atheism from ritual worship to deep philosophical and ethical thought. And all this has come about because of a distinctive and unique worldview. The whole universe is cognized as one holistic organism. From there you see, that's one Atma. The subtlest of the creation is the Self, Consciousness. And then that has many different modalities. Divine and formless is the person. He is without and within, unborn, without breath and without mind, pure and higher than the highest immutable. Fire is his head. His eyes are the sun and the moon. The regions of space are his ears, his speech the revealed Vedas. Air is his life and his heart the world. Out of his feet the earth is born. Indeed, he is the self of all beings. The person himself is all this, work, austerity and Brahma beyond death. He who knows that which is set in the secret place of the heart, he here on earth, O beloved cuts asunder the knot of ignorance. All of us go to all places. Whether you go to Bombay, Delhi, or anywhere else. तो हमारे को वैराग्य होता है संसार के ऊपर कि हमको इस संसार में पाप नहीं करना है हमको ब्रह्मचारी जीवन जीना है इसलिए हम फिर दीक्षा लेने के तैयार होते हैं जब हम दीक्षा लेते हैं ना तब भगवान और हमारे गुरु महाराज और धर्म की साक्षी में हम पांच प्रतिज्ञा करते हैं कि हमें इस जीवन में किसी भी जीव को नहीं मारना है
This statue is 17 meters tall, nearly 60 feet. It is of Lord Bahubali Gomateshwara at Shravan Belagola in Karnataka in southern India. This is considered the tallest statue in the world, a monolithic statue carved out of a single rock. Shravan Belagola is perhaps the most important pilgrimage center for the Jain religion. Actually, we say Jain religion, but Jainism is actually totally atheistic. It believes in pran, or a life force, as opposed to an imminent, all-pervading force in the universe. The Jains believe that we have to face the consequences of not only our actions, but also of our thoughts and desires. All this is accumulated as one's karma. To be liberated from the cycle of eternal birth and death, the individual must reduce the burden of his karma or actions through right thought and action and the practice of non-violence. Non-violence, uh, uh, ahimsa, it's been perfected in Indian philosophical and spiritual traditions uh, uh, in a very unique way. So much so that this notion became extremely prominent in 5th century BC. And then it was recycled by Gandhi in uh, the 20th century. And he, he recycled it precisely uh, by using the traditional Indian ideas about, you know, Ahimsa, which he was obviously influenced by the Jain and the Buddhist and the Hindu thoughts about it. Subdued have I all, all-knowing am I now, unattached to all things and abandoning all. Finally freed on the destruction of all craving, knowing it myself, whom else should I credit? There is no teacher of mine, nor is one like me. There is none to rival me in the world of men and gods. Truly entitled to honor am I, a teacher unexcelled. Alone am I, a supreme Buddha, placid and tranquil. Any old civilization develops both strengths and weaknesses. It develops uh, a certain amount of envy in the population. The bourgeoisie tend to become decadent. There is need for challenge and questioning. Life becomes uncreative 
at that point of time. Also, the Hindu kings of that period were engaged in too many wars. Uh, uh, the Mahabharata Yudh was one classic example. So uh, the Buddha came in the eastern part of India as a strong reaction against this tradition of Hinduism. <laughs> Gautam Buddha was born as a prince of Rajgriha, situated in the foothills of the Himalayas. He renounced his princely life in order to find a solution to the problems of disease, old age and death. The Buddha's concern was the alleviation of human suffering, and his teachings are ethical rather than religious. He laid stress on good actions and the practice of non-violence. He believed in dharma or universal law and was silent about the existence of God, although he never formally denied it. One of the main persons responsible for the spread of Buddhism was the Emperor Ashok after the Kalinga War. The War of Kalinga. The Great War of Kalinga, fought by Emperor Ashok, which he won, in which millions were wounded, or killed, or taken prisoner. And seeing the futility of it all, appalled by the carnage, Emperor Ashok, renounced war as a means, as an end to his reign, to his life, and embraced the path of dharm or duty. And he set up his rock inscriptions as a result. Preaching his new faith, he embraced Buddhism, thus turning it from what was then just a sectarian belief into one of the major religions of the world. He sent messengers all over Southeast Asia and China to spread the teachings of the Buddha. Our goal is Nirvana, Moksha. In a way, our mind produces cyclic existence. In order to liberate from that cyclic existence, we, we have to implement some you say, practice looks against the dead nature. Once you as a, realize or accept it, the nirvana no longer cycle existence, no longer has to be rebirth, then you, see, you have to tackle the ultimate sources of rebirth. That's attachment. In the Buddha list of virtues is Maitri, friendship, universal friendship, friendship with everyone, Karuna, compassion, compassion for everyone, mudita, joy in the happiness of everyone, and upeksha, treating others as equals so that you have, you love everyone irrespective of whether they reciprocate your love or not. You must attain through a very hard discipline, a state in which no desire or aversion stirs you to action. Is there any reality behind what we see? If there is a reality, can I perceive that reality? And how? We find in Upanishad the literature a question being asked again and again by the kings as well as the layman as to who am I? You know, unless you find that answer, you don't. You're not satisfied. So this search for the self takes you away from 
a very comfortable world and takes you into the forest as if, you know, only by seeking you will know who you are. The banyan tree with its huge protective canopy of branches, foliage and leaves is worshipped as sacred in India. In fact, it has often found reference in the Upanishads, the holy books. The Upanishads themselves mean to sit near the Guruji and to imbibe wisdom from the Guru. The banyan tree features thus in one of the discourses in the Upanishads. The Guru asks his student to fetch the fruit of the banyan tree. The student says, I have brought it. The Guru says, break it. I have broken it. What do you see? Very tiny seeds, says the student. Break one of the seeds. I have broken it. Now what do you see? I see nothing. My son, in what you do not perceive lies the essence. And in that essence, this mighty banyan tree exists. And believe me, my son, in that essence is the self of all that exists. That is the truth. That is the self. Tattvam Asi, that thou art. Analyze the energies with your prana, with the mantras, with your actions, because you show certain mudras that your body takes part in it, your mind takes part in it, your subtle forces, your breath takes part in it. And all these things together will awaken the power that's in you. That's channelized and used for the benefit of either for you or for the mankind. <laughs> यज्ञ एक वैज्ञानिक प्रक्रिया है जो हमारे ऋषियों के द्वारा बनाई गई है और उसमें एक ज्योमेट्री के लिए यदि आप देखें तो यज्ञ कुंड होता है और यज्ञ कुंड जो मंदिर होता है वो ऐसा होता है हमारा और यज्ञ कुंड जो होता है वो ऐसा होता है मंदिर जो है कॉस्मिक एनर्जी को कंसेंट्रेट करके एक पॉइंट पर इकट्ठा करता है और वो मूर्ति हो सकती है मूर्ति के नीचे का पैर हो सकता है शिवलिंग हो सकता है और इसी प्रकार से हमारे जितने पैरामिड्स थे सब बनते थे इसी प्रकार से हमारे टॉम्स की सभी डिजाइन थी उसी को उल्टा कर दीजिए तो यज्ञ कुंड बन जाता है ट्रेपेजॉइंट और जितनी एनर्जी कॉस्मिक एनर्जी होती है उसको डिसिपेट करने का काम फैलाने का काम करने का काम यज्ञ का होता है ऑल द तांत्रिक डायग्राम्स दैट यू सी will be made of either curves which is a form of a circle and straight lines mandala represents your subconscious mind so it has got all the elements which can stimulate your subconscious so you see sit in front of the mandala which is colorful which has certain pattern in it which is lit by lamps and you do the chanting it causes and it creates an atmosphere which causes the awakening of the power which is latent in you human body there are seven positions seven subtle places where energy is concentrated and the basic one is called the mooladhara and mooladhara is the principle of solidity so as i said solidity is represented as a square 
and that's the place where the kundalini the latent power is in every one of us and it's there in us and it is latent in the muladhara and when you do your sadhana it said that the agni will be awakened kindled this is myself within the heart smaller than a grain of rice then a barley corn then a mustard seed then a grain of millet or then a kernel of a grain of a millet this is myself within the heart greater than the earth greater than the atmosphere greater than the sky greater than these worlds containing all works containing all desires containing all odors containing all tastes encompassing this whole world without speech without concern this is the self of mine within the heart this is brahman into him i shall enter on departing hence The Indian civilization has demonstrated a great capacity to assimilate new thoughts, ideas and culture. The coming of Islam with its ideas of the brotherhood of man, the oneness of God, the surrender of man to God's will and the non-ritualistic attitude to religion made a great impact on Indian thinkers and reformers. The continuous interchange of ideas gave rise to the very popular movements of Sufism and Bhakti. The Sufi emphasis on love, equality of all human beings and universal brotherhood was similar to the Vedantic philosophy which states that individual souls are manifestations of the supreme soul or God and they finally merge into it. In the fabric of Indian spiritual achievement, there are many contrasting and remarkable strands of synthesis, of composite culture. For instance, did you know that the deeply mystical Sufi tradition actually doesn't believe in God, and yet it has a great deal in common with the Bhakti tradition? 
which demands an almost complete identification with God. है बाउल का देवता तो वही जो देवता है वही मुनिर मनुष्य का साधना करने के लिए बाउल घूमता है देश और विदेश हर जगह पर घूमता है मुनिर मनुष्य को मिलने के लिए एवं मुनिर मनुष्य जब मिल जाएगा तो वही भगवान दर्शन हो जाएगा द बाउल्स आर वंडरिंग मेंडिकन सिंगर्स हु एक्सप्रेस देयर लव फॉर गॉड थ्रू डिवोशनल सॉन्ग्स The Sufis represent one aspect of Islam, and our languages betray that, and of course our bhakti literature betray that immense amount of give and take happen, as it always happens when our other enters into your life, it changes the character of your life. So you become a part of our psyche. So Sufis influence us in the way we sing. I would, I would, the Bauls, for example, or the uh, uh, Kabir is a great example of how both traditions mature into a great resolution. of universal expression batao pyar se maulad ka maloom hota hai batao pyar se maulad ka maloom hota hai wo aayi rahe jisme khuda maloom hota hai wo aayi rahe jisme khuda maloom hota hai aayi ka ghar bhi ka ghar hai ke jin ghar ka har bacha aayi ka ghar bhi ka ghar hai ke jin ghar ka har bacha aayi ka ghar bhi ka ghar hai ke jin ghar ka har bacha The simple requirements of love, a clean heart, and no rituals, coupled with the immensely powerful healing quality of devotional music, have a widespread appeal for persons of all faiths and denominations. The popular shrines of the saints offer people a space to address God intimately and personally, without any external intervention or intermediary. <laughs> What binds a great Sufi mystic and poet like Amir Khusro with other mystics like Tukaram or Kabir? I think the answer is love. Love universal, love unbounded, unfettered. Love that joins one heart to another. Naam kaise hota patrat pavan naam kaise hota to hi mohe mohe to hi to hi mohe अंतर कैसा अंतर कैसा कनक कटक जल तंग जैसा कनक कटक जल तंग जैसा तो ही मोहे मोहे तो ही तो ही मोहे पर 
The Golden Temple at Amritsar, Punjab is the focal point of the Sikh religion. The word Sikh means disciple and they are the followers of the teachings of Guru Nanak, the great mystic and saint of the 15th century. Guru Nanak believed that God is one, without form and ineffable. He preached the common brotherhood of man. Christianity came first to India as early as the 2nd century AD and it found its own place in the hearts and minds of the people. India has celebrated the religious and philosophical spirit of man, regardless of its source. All faiths and beliefs are practiced fervently, and yet... The Vedic religion doesn't deal only with matters of cosmological abstraction. It also deals with everyday life, with problems of morality, ethics, politics, action. For instance, in the great epic Mahabharata, you can see some very interesting episodes from the Mahabharata epic along this frieze here. Arjun stops in the middle of the Kurukshetra battle and cannot continue because suddenly he wonders how could he take the life of his own brothers, of his own blood. And it is here that Lord Krishna steps forward and tells him, look, my friend, this is what you should know. And what he says actually constitutes the essence of India's spiritual wisdom. There is nothing in the three worlds, O Arjuna, that remains to be done by me. Nor is there anything to be attained that has not been attained. Yet, I engage myself in action. Always efficiently do your duty without attachment. Doing work without attachment, man attains the supreme. 
the spiritual uh, uh, features of the Indian mind, uh, has addressed itself very seriously to these questions, very well. And Bhagavad Gita has also addressed this question because Arjun is suffering from anxiety. He is full of shoka and he is, of course, bhayabhita. Uh, and uh, he doesn't want to function exactly like a, you know, a, a person who sulks and sits in the corner and says, I don't want to do my job. And Krishna says, look, you know, it's important that you do what you're supposed to do. This self within the body of the nature of light and pure is attainable by truth, by austerity, by right knowledge, by the constant practice of chastity. Him, the ascetics with their imperfections done away, behold, this self cannot be attained by instructions, nor by intellectual power, nor even through much hearing. He is to be attained by the one whom the self chooses. To such a one, the self reveals his own nature. He says, Father, please teach me. He says, Son, there you see the tree. Forsaken by life, a twig dies. Forsaken by life, a branch of the tree also dies. Forsaken by life, the tree itself dies, but life dies not. That which does not die, that pervades this all. It pervades you also. That is the reality. Tattvam asi. The syllable Om is the bow. Oneself indeed is the arrow. Brahman is spoken of as the target of that. It is to be hit without making a mistake. Thus one becomes united with it as the arrow becomes one with the target. Om is seen as the primal syllable, not only by Hindu practitioners, but also by Buddhist and by Jain um, practitioners. It is seen as the primal syllable the sound from which the universe itself comes into being. And it is associated, the three syllables that make up uh, the syllable Om are associated with three different levels of consciousness. And uh, Om, once it is chanted, can be seen as the model for an inward journey to the deepest level of consciousness. It's a beautiful prayer I can think of. It's not like saying, God give me wealth, God give me money, God give me a beautiful wife. It says, enlighten me. And what better prayer can you say, I tell you. In the practice of yoga, it, it helps the psychological body to become dynamically positive to face the tension and stress of the world because there is no accumulation or closure in the system. Because it's a bottomless pit, as I said, as it is a bottomless pit from this inner core of the being to the outer, there is a tremendous pore. So we throw out the mental impurities, the physical impurities, and so that, and that's why yoga has attracted millions of people all over the world. Yoga teaches you how to be quiet and just slow down and close your eyes and instead of opening your eyes it teaches you how to close your eyes and we have found in Mohenjo-daro and Harappan civilization uh, you know seated monks who are in the meditational pose which shows that the practices of dhyana were are very ancient to Indian mind Oh, my God. 
Of all pilgrimage centers and places of worship, Varanasi in northern India on the banks of the holy river Ganga is the physical embodiment, the manifest symbol of the Indian religious, philosophical and spiritual universe. It is the bridge between this world and the next. To die in Varanasi, believe devout Hindus, is to gain immediate salvation, liberation from the eternal cycle of birth and death. Truly, Varanasi is both the beginning and the end of Dharma, eternal India's path of righteousness. Mm -hmm.